Welcome to the 12th Annual Peter Tammany Memorial Lecture on American Language. We hold it each year on the fourth Thursday of April since 1986. This lecture honors the memory of Peter Tammany, known as the Word Man of San Francisco. Tammany became interested in American colloquial language when he went to work on the other side of Market Street, as he put it, in San Francisco in the early 1920s when his father died, leaving him as the main breadwinner for his mother and sister. Peter had grown up in an ethnic neighborhood in the Mission District on the south side of Market Street, which was populated by Irish and European immigrants. As a, blank, as a bank clerk, he heard language from the financial district that was different in both obvious and subtle ways from the dialects he grew up with in the working class mission district. He began making notations on four by six cards of words and phrases that struck him as particularly interesting or innovative. He found so many terms in newspapers and books that he soon abandoned uh, this uh, idea of putting them on cards and started clipping things out of newspapers and uh, collected books and a uh, great variety of things. He continued building his citation file for over 60 years until his death in July 1985. Newspeople and dictionary publishers, including the OED, frequently contacted Peter to ask what he had on words in everyday parlance in sports, popular music, jazz, politics, and uh, he was secretary of the Hot Jazz Society of San Francisco and knew everybody uh, in both political parties, but mainly the Democratic Party. In December of 1985, uh, Peter's sister, Kathleen, gave her brother's collection to the Western Historic Manuscript Collection uh, here in Columbia. Upon the advice of Archie Green, a well-known folklorist in San Francisco and a longtime friend of Peter's, uh, and Professor Gerald Cohen uh, of the University of Missouri Rolla, who's editor of the publication Comments on Etymology, and then several individuals here at the University of Missouri Columbia. In early 1986, a moving van full of an assortment of shrink wrapped boxes, uh, it was a massive amount, arrived and was assigned to senior archivist Randy Roberts, who's, don't see, see him, he's, he's in here somewhere, he's back in the back. Um, who transferred Tammany's files to acid-free boxes to make them last longer. Now, several times a week, linguists, dictionary editors, word hounds, and popular writers contact Randy to find out what the Tammany file has on this or that word. So it's being used quite widely. At the reception following this talk, you'll be able to see a sample of these files uh, over across the way in the, uh, in the reading room. Uh, we, this lecture is sponsored each year by a number of, of, uh, of uh, organizations uh, on campus and, and elsewhere, and there are about 12 of them. I, I hope they'll pardon me for not reading all of them, but the, the uh, invitation you got has them all listed. Today, in honor of the Word Man of San Francisco, we have as our speaker a distinguished scholar of American language. Michael Montgomery, professor of English and Linguistics at the University of South Carolina, has edited five books and published uh, at least five, and published numerous articles on American dialects, such as an artic the article on Southern English in the Encyclopedia of Southern Culture, an article on the etymology of y'all, uh, the historical sources of double, double modal auxiliaries, such as might could, as in I might could give you an example if I could think of one. Uh, and the linguistic value of Ulster immigrant letters. He's currently editing the Dictionary of Smoky, Mar Smoky Mountain English. In recent years, Michael has concentrated on origins of uh, Scotch-Irish language and culture in the U.S. and the spread of it. Uh, in, in this research, he has answered a number of questions that linguists have been pondering for some time. N that's the topic of his talk today, and he tells me he has recently solved a puzzle or two and may give us the answer. The title of his presentation is The Many Faces of the Scotch-Irish. Who were they and why does it matter? Okay. Get a little higher on you, I don't think. I can read it, hold 
but here it only went. So. Okay. I guess the microphone is so uh, I don't have I don't have a chance to run away very far or at least very easily. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. I want to especially thank uh, Don Lance and members of the uh, Western Historical Manuscript uh, Collection and staff, uh, Randy Roberts, Nancy Langford, Sue McCubbin, uh, and others for their uh, assistance and their hospitality. Uh, it's uh, a delight to be invited to uh, share a few of my thoughts, uh, not only to follow some of uh, the people in this field uh, who've been here in previous years that I respect most highly, but also to have the chance to uh, share some of my experiences over the last few years as I have thought, sought to uh, rediscover my own heritage, uh, the speech of my ancestors, and to try to figure out what all that means. There are two questions in the uh, title in the subtitle uh, of the paper today, and they will indicate that uh, a good portion is going to be of a historical nature, and also the, the latterly, the latter half of the paper will deal mostly with language once we've established that historical context. When I was growing up in Knoxville, Tennessee, I took in the eighth grade a required course on the state's history. There I and my classmates learned, uh, among other things, who the three uh, presidents were that Tennessee contributed to that national office. And these were Andrew Jackson, James K. Polk, and Andrew Johnson. Now at some point we also learned that these three men were actually born elsewhere, in the Carolinas actually, but this mattered little to us since they had adopted the volunteer state and they had built their careers there. These men were Tennesseans foremost. It was therefore a bit unsettling to me when uh, after moving to South Carolina in 1981 to learn that not only did both Carolinas fervently claim Andy Jackson, who was born in 1767 in a vaguely mapped area of the Carolina Piedmont but that the two states were still debating the issue, putting forth claims and counterclaims of, ex of the exact site of Jackson's nativity, especially uh, arguing in letters to the local newspaper editor. After living in, uh, <coughs> after living in uh, Columbia, that is the other Columbia for a decade, and hearing all the local arguments, I could begin to concede to South Carolina a share of Old Hickory, but little could have prepared me for the surprise of finding still another claimant to him in what might seem to be half a world away. When traveling in Northern Ireland in 1990, I found that the tiny village of Bondi Before took credit for Jackson as well. Indeed, in this county Antrim community, which one reaches a mile outside the medieval fortress town of Carrick Fergus, 15 miles north of Belfast, one comes suddenly on a roadside cottage which calls itself the Andrew Jackson Center. Uh, this site features craftwork demonstrations, related events, and historical videos, such as From Here to the White House, uh, whose account begins in 1765, two years before Andy Jackson was actually born. In presenting a chronology of, quote, Andrew Jackson, 1765 to 1845, seventh president of the United States of America, the center's brochure states Ireland's claim to Jackson's prenatal home, to be Jackson's prenatal home though of course he could hardly have even been conceived there. Now this small place in the north of Ireland in the historic Irish province of Ulster is no mere tourist trap and the attempt to share Jackson's reputation is much more than local boosterism. 
Anyone who spends time in the bookshops of Northern Ireland, who follows its popular press, or becomes acquainted with the activities of its 60 local historical societies, finds an extensive popular literature on Ulster people who went to North America in the 18th or early 19th century and who contributed to the newly developing United States of America. One comes across small books like Ulster Sails West, the story of the great migration from Ulster to North America in the 18th century. And the highest call, Ulster and the American Presidency. The latter book provides capsule biographies of US presidents having Ulster ancestry and features Bill Clinton in its latest edition. One finds articles such as one in New Ulster magazine that states, quote, Andrew Jackson was destined to be a great leader and to enter the White House as the first of the Ulster presidents of the United States of America. Ulster presidents? Ulster presidents? Uh, this is a term I dare say few Americans and few members of this audience are familiar with. In Northern Ireland, however, it has currency, and there is an official ancestral home site, not only for Andrew Jackson, but also for Chester Arthur, Woodrow Wilson, and Ulysses S. Grant. The literature goes on to considerable length to name the men of Ulster stock who signed the Declaration of Independence, who printed the Declaration of Independence, who led the assault at King's Mountain that turned the tide of the Revolutionary War in the Carolinas in 1780, who served as generals during the American Revolution, 21 by one reckoning, who later became president of the United States, uh, at least 12 uh, men, and so on. In short, there is a keen popular awareness unparalleled anywhere else in the British Isles and maybe anywhere else in the old world of strong historical ties with the US, even though these took place many generations ago. Now, if any of us were to conduct a survey asking people which part of the British Isles most influenced the development of the United States, it's quite unlikely that Ulster would be named very frequently. Indeed, if we got an answer very often to that question at all, and by the same token, if I polled the assembled members of the American Dialect Society at its annual meeting, asking which of the regions, uh, excuse me, asking which, which region's speech had the profoundest and most crucial influence on American English, which region is most responsible for the distinctive regional varieties of American speech that have developed, and that they, dialectologists, have spent much of the past century mapping, I have little doubt that very few of them would mention Ulster. Now, there are perfectly understandable reasons why my brethren and sistern in the Dialect Society might draw a blank on this question. It's been far from easy to answer. The basic resources, such as dictionaries, needed for making transatlantic comparisons in speech have been inadequate or unavailable. Nor has the mining of old documents to recover dialect forms proceeded very far. And these transatlantic language connections represent only one factor in the development of American dialects. Many probably most of the terms that discriminate regional speech varieties in America, both today and historically, are new. That is, they're Americanisms that arose or were crafted as speakers of English settled on this continent, and they're unknown in the British Isles today and historically. For instance, there's the lower south ter uh, term, red bug, versus the Upper South and Midwestern term chigger for the tiny creature that burrows under the skin and makes you scratch hellaciously. There's the Southern term dressing uh, versus the Northern term stuffing for the Thanksgiving side dish to turkey. And then there's the Southern fixin' to versus Northern, I don't know, just what do they say in the North that's equivalent to fixin' to? 
Uh, I'm not sure there is an exact equivalent to that. But all of these terms that I've mentioned are Americanisms, unknown in the British Isles, but distinctively regional on this side of the water. But of those linguistic usages that can be traced historically, which do have discernible antecedents in the British Isles, the Ulster element I propose this afternoon is absolutely critical to, uh, to explaining how American regional dialects have formed, not only historically, but also in the modern day. Not only in the areas along the Atlantic coast where Ulster immigrants originally settled and where distinctive accents can most readily be heard today, but also in the broad heartland of the country's midsection, a region that includes Missouri, or is it Missouri? I'll let you tell me. Uh, a region that includes Missouri and is distinct from both the northern and the southern tier of states, at least in the eastern half of the country. Linguists have called this area, this region, the American Midland, since Hans Kurra, director of the Linguistic Atlas Project uh, to map American dialects, outlined this region about a half century ago. And we'll return to discuss the Midland region just a little bit later. Now my proposal about the Ulster influence on American English involves grammatical patterns rather than vocabulary. And here there's an important distinction that linguists often make. By vocabulary, we mean nouns, adjectives, and most verbs and adverbs. These are words that refer to something or activity or quality in the real world. Grammar refers to how words and elements of language are put together, how they relate to one another, rather than what the individual words mean. Thus, grammatical features are such things as suffixes on verbs and nouns, word order patterns involving combinations of two or more words in a distinct way, pronouns, function words such as prepositions, conjunctions, and adverbs that relate words to one another in a clause or sentence. This distinction between vocabulary and grammar is not just a technical one made by linguists, nor is it arbitrary. It's crucially important to us because vocabulary can change, disappear, and spread over space much more rapidly than can grammar, which is more stable across generations and therefore easier to track historically. Even today, it's new vocabulary and terminology that can catch on around the country almost overnight. But grammar, uh, on the other hand, has been shown by linguists to be deeper in a language, more resistant to change, or at least rapid change. Grammar, how words are related to one another within a sentence, is usually based on unconscious rules learned in childhood. In short, grammar generally provides a more valid basis for tracing the ancestry of varieties of American English to the British Isles. My purposes in the rest of this presentation are as follows. First, I'll provide uh, more historical and cultural backdrop to this major but unappreciated fact about the Ulster contribution to American English. Because of the complexities of this uh, immigration, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the, uh, this Ulster immigration, it will be necessary uh, to sketch this uh, in some detail. And secondly, I will briefly offer a few further comments about why this fact about the Ulster contribution has been missed until now. Then I'll illustrate with a number of specific features the inheritance from Ulster speech that is so crucial in understanding the differences between regional varieties in American English. And if your curiosity is getting ahead of you, you might take a quick glance at the end of your handout. Beginning, you do need a handout uh, this afternoon. Uh, so look on to one uh, with someone else uh, if you don't have one in hand. If you look at the bottom of page five, I have uh, a list of uh, that continues on to the uh, next page, a list of 12 grammatical features 
all of which have ulcer ancestry, all of which have some, at least some currency in the Midland region of the United States. And that's the core of uh, my argument this afternoon. But obviously we have uh, uh, a little way to go between here and there. And finally, at the end of the presentation, I'll explain why, or at least propose why, these features have survived for the last 200 years and discuss the implications of this survival. And in the process, I will solve what I refer to as Kurat's puzzle. Now, how did it happen that the speech of such a small corner of northwestern Europe, a province of nine counties, actually only parts of four counties, as we shall see, had such a profound influence on American English. Who were these people? There have been many different views of them, some flattering, some not flattering. Some commentators have described them, as already suggested, as the builders of the new nation, as prototypical pioneers, heroic in character and accomplishments. At the turn of the present century, this mythic view reigned supreme, and the best-known description of them appeared in Teddy Roosevelt's book, The Winning of the West. Roosevelt wrote that they were, quote, the vanguard of the army of fighting settlers, who with axe and rifle won their way from the Alleghenies to the Rio Grande and the Pacific, unquote. And according to historian Frederick Jackson Turner, architect of the frontier thesis in American history, they embraced the frontier and subdued all in their path. But on the other hand, historians like Arnold Toynbee have seen Ulster immigrants as primarily the ancestor of modern day poor whites in the South, as people prone to violence, intemperance, and narrow mindedness crackers in the Lower South, and hillbillies in the Appalachians and the Ozarks. And interestingly enough, both of those terms probably were brought by Ulster immigrants to this country. Uh, most more recently, a view has developed of these immigrants as quintessentially American in another sense, that they quickly shed their old world ethnicity and assimilated in their new environment, rapidly adapting to life on the American continent, modifying their own cultural inheritance as they needed uh, when they met uh, uh, the conditions of the new nation, and freely borrowing cultural elements from other groups to add to their own. And thus, they adopted, for instance, the dulcimer, the musical instrument, uh, the dulcimer from Germans in Virginia. They adopted the, the log cabin from Swedes and Germans in Pennsylvania, and so on. This view states that the Scotch-Irish disappeared as a distinct ethnic group by the end of the 18th century. Contrasting with this is a recently elaborated thesis by uh, historian David Hackett Fisher, in his book, Albion Seed, Four British Folkways in America, 1989. Fisher argues that much of the material and mental culture brought by Ulster immigrants was preserved in what, be, in what became known as the American backcountry, especially in Southern Appalachia. Although he emphasized the persistence of these cultural traits, Fisher did agree that the people themselves lost self-consciousness, lost self-identification of themselves as a group. So historians disagree about the character of these people and, they, uh, and their role in American history. And there also are disagreements about their proper name. Let me, in the next few minutes, uh, indicate uh, what some of these disagreements are and uh, what some of the agreements are. As far as their name is concerned, Scotch-Irish is the traditional designation. It's used by both popular writers and scholars in this country. It's the term used, for instance, in the Harvard Dictionary of American Ethnic Groups. But this particular term, Scotch-Irish, has a curious history. 
It was used in the 18th century when Ulster people migrated here only by outsiders who scorned them. And it wasn't popular among descendants of Ulster immigrants until towards the end of the 19th century. More recently, the term Scots-Irish has gained currency primarily because it avoids the term Scotch and thus it satisfies the prudish who don't want to associate these, uh, their ancestors in most cases uh, with hard drinkers. The usual term for these people in Ireland and historically the most accurate term is Ulster Scots. However, the only terms that Ulster immigrants apparently used for themselves when immigrating were Irish and Protestant Irish. Now, I'll employ the term Scotch-Irish here today because it's most widespread, it's the conventional term. But all of this, uh, this variation in terminology might seem to be a bit confusing. However, there are a few things on which historians agree. Uh, one of them is that between 200 and 250,000 people left Ulster in the six decades preceding the American Revolution. Americans of Ulster ancestry, of Ulster extraction, formed approximately one-sixth of the European-derived population at the time of the first national census in 1790. This is based on surname research. It's also generally agreed that these people were overwhelmingly uh, Presbyterian. They were dissenting Protestants opposed to the established church, the Church of England, uh, but more recent research has shown that at least 10% of the 18th century Ulster migrants were Catholic and probably just as many were uh, English uh, of Anglican uh, affiliation. It's generally agreed that the great majority of these people, the Presbyterians, were of Scottish ancestry and tradition and, the, and that the forebears of these people had migrated from Scotland one to four generations earlier following the establishment of the plantation of Ulster under King James I in 1610. And they settled along a crescent on the northeastern coast of Ireland in Ulster. That the Scottish population in Ulster formed cultural enclaves then is shown by the fact that there are still significant areas of Ulster Scott speech there today. And for this, you can refer to the first page of your handout, map one. You can see there are shaded areas uh, in County Down, in Antrim, in County Derry, on over into Donegal. These four counties have today speakers uh, of a language variety derived from Scotland rather than from England, a language varieties that is called a, a language variety that is called Ulster Scots there. Now these people in this small area of Ulster and their descendants were Scots in Ulster. And in this sense, the term Scotch-Irish may be misleading because they were, with uh, few exceptions, not a mixed population of Scottish and Irish. They maintained their Scottish uh, uh, traits, at least their speech, in coming uh, to this country. In North America, immigrants from Ulster landed overwhelmingly in one small uh, area, the Delaware Valley, uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. And they were most easy to distinguish by one institution they brought, Presbyterianism. Almost immediately, they began to move inland and to disperse and within two generations of their original coming, around 1717, 1718 or so, a large proportion, probably a majority of them, uh, of, of their descendants, uh, had lost their Presbyterianism, mainly to follow the Baptist and other groups. And you might take a look at map two here on the second page of your handout, uh, which provides just uh, a very a uh, simple overview of their migration, their dispersal from the uh, lower Delaware Valley 
there in the Philadelphia area. Uh, the story of their leapfrogging down the great wagon road that ran from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania to Salem, North Carolina, and then later to Augusta, Georgia in the 18th century is well known, as is their migration across Pennsylvania to Pittsburgh, which one commentator has estimated was 90% Scotch-Irish in the 1790s. They and their descendants were a, if not the, dominant settlement group in much of the backcountry, settling the western parts of Pennsylvania, Virginia, and the Carolinas. These movements placed their descendants in strategic places at the headwaters of the Ohio River and in the Carolina Piedmont for further migration westward. And from these areas, the lower Midwest and much of the interior south especially the, the Upper South, were settled. The Scotch-Irish were, in many ways, a people of paradox. They came in significant numbers. Historians can identify them from shipping records, but they left few contemporary accounts of themselves, especially after the colonial period. The few that have survived, or the few that exist, are being collected and edited for publication by the University of Missouri historian Kirby Miller. These Ulster migrants left far less information about themselves than many groups of much smaller size uh, from other parts of Europe. Unlike David Hackett Fisher, most scholars have found their influence very difficult to detect. It's undeniably there in music, dance, folk architecture, folklore, and other areas of material and expressive culture, but it's very elusive. It's hard to find. A bibliographic search combining Ulster and folk culture turns up very, very little, especially if we compare the Scotch-Irish to Germans, another large non-English speaking immigrant group in colonial uh, America. This lack of documentation appears to support the assimilationist view that the Scotch-Irish disappeared as a distinct ethnic group shortly after arrival. How then can we trace them and their descendants over the past two centuries? I submit there are at least three ways that we can do this. One of them is through their names. We know they were here in 1790 because of the first census and later analyses of that since Valley and the Chesapeake, and as those lines extend west, uh, they take in the lower Middle West, uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, uh, Missouri, uh, and so on. Now, Kuros' own research was based only on the Atlantic states but he hypothesized the extension of these regions farther west based on what he knew, not from the collection of language, but from his knowledge of settlement history, his knowledge of how people and where people migrated uh, from the Atlantic states. Uh, you have on page five of your handout, uh, Kurat's basic statement about the Midland region. He says, this far-flung Midland area, settled largely by Pennsylvanians and by their descendants in the southern uplands, 
constitutes a separate speech area which is distinct from the northern area. Uh, and, uh, excuse me, the northern area, the New England settlement area, and distinct from the southern area. Its northern boundaries run in a westerly direction through the northern counties of Pennsylvania, its southern boundary in a southwesterly direction through the Blue Ridge and through the Carolina Piedmont. The South Midland, to be sure, exhibits a considerable infusion of Southern vocabulary and pronunciations. After 1720, large flocks of Ulster Scots and Palatine Germans arrived on Delaware Bay and spread out into the backcountry of Philadelphia and then westward into the Alleghenies and the Ohio Valley, and then southward through Western Maryland and Virginia to the Carolinas. The influence of the English-speaking Ulster Scots upon the speech of certain sections of Pennsylvania and of the southern uplands cannot be doubted, but it is surprisingly intangible. Those are my words there, or my emphasis. The key words here, of course, are surprisingly intangible. Kurath knew his settlement history very well, and from it he expected to find correlations in language. In positing the Midland region, he identified 17 terms that appeared to be distinct from the northern and southern regions that uh, he outlined in the passage that we have just read, and these are given in number two in your handout. Uh, there are 17 terms here, beginning with ball for the sound that a calf makes, blinds for curtains, uh, green beans, which used to be regional, now it's national, uh, and so on. His survey actually was done primarily in the 30s and 40s and interviewed older people, so you can see that it reflected uh, quite an earlier stage uh, of American English. Now, Kurov, because he knew his settlement history, expected to find a number of German and Ulster terms that define the Midland region. But by his reckoning, from the dictionaries that he had at hand and the information available to him, these could not be found. None of the 17 uh, were unambiguously German. And while five of them actually we do know today have an Ulster ancestry, these five are hull, which you do to beans, peace, for the distance, till, as in quarter till or quarter two, want off or want to get off, and yuns for the pronoun, the plural pronoun. Now, all of these are in fact traceable to the north of Ireland but Kurath apparently didn't know that. He doesn't indicate that any of these have Ulster ancestry. He was, so far as we can tell, quite puzzled why no terms that he found to have a distinct Midland distribution could be traced to either German or Ulster immigrants. Now, of the vocabulary used in the American Midland, the vast bulk consists of either terms that originated in the United States or were brought by people from several regions of Britain. And only a handful can be determined to have a Scotch-Irish origin. Some of these are specialized. For instance, there are several terms for moonshining that can indeed be traced to uh, the Ulster migrants. Uh, but most of them are of a more general nature. And I've given these to you uh, in number three on the handout there. Uh, most of these terms would have competed unsuccessfully, most likely, uh, or, or most Ulster-derived terms would have competed unsuccessfully, it appears, with equivalent terms from more prestigious varieties of English. For instance, the first term on this list uh, has been competing with the more general term chili. Uh, Irish has been competing with chili uh, for some time. Uh, backset has been competing with uh, a setback or uh, relapse uh, and so on. 
and these this competition uh, with more prestigious or more widespread uh, English vocabulary uh, probably accounts for the very small number of Ulster derived vocabulary that can be found in this country at all. And this list here uh, includes terms that are used in the Midland, though many of them are by no means confined to the middle part of the country. And I think a quick look at them would indicate that uh, case for Ulster influence. That is, this is the evidence from vocabulary. So I've given you in number three in the handout, and you can look at these in the grammar. There are a dozen features of grammar. I've listed them in number four on the handout, having at least in part a Midland distribution. They make up almost the complete list of distinctive grammatical features in the Midland region of the U.S., so far as I can tell, and all of these have Ulster ancestry. Many of these features may strike the audience as highly vernacular, some of them perhaps quaint and old-fashioned, a few of them common but uneducated. None of this is a mystery. These are all characteristic of speech. And even if they do show up in writing from time to time, it's only to represent the dialect of a speaker. On some of the features uh, on, uh, in this list, uh, members of the audience may draw a complete blank. You have never heard them, you say. You're sure you've never heard them. I'm not so sure that you haven't. And I will offer in a moment an explanation for why they are hard to notice. So you have a list here of 12 features. Uh, again, uh, uh, I will not uh, proceed through them one by one. Uh, there are uh, definitions and uh, illustrations here. Uh, we find combinations of words, uh, for instance, uh, combinations like might, could. Uh, you might could ask somebody along the road um, uh, that uh, Professor Lance mentioned in the introduction. There are uh, phrases like all the, I didn't, actually I didn't uh, give an illustration here, but uh, an example would be that's all the one I have. All the meaning the only, that's all the one I have. Uh, which uh, is uh, uh, attested uh, in the American Midland. Uh, and there are many others here uh, as well, several of which uh, I will return to uh, in just a moment. But for the sake of time, I will leave these uh, for your study uh, at greater leisure. So my argument here is that the Midland area uh, is much better defined in terms of grammatical features than vocabulary. Hans Karras, who edited the Linguistic Atlas of the United States in Canada, and he formulated the modern concept of Midland, relied on vocabulary because this, in fact, is what the Atlas survey collected. It was much easier to collect, ask a person, what term do you use for such and such a thing, than to collect grammatical features. And likewise, recent scholarly debates in the American dialect society on the validity of the Midland dialect region have used vocabulary. And they have come to mixed, if not ambiguous, conclusions about whether there is a Midland region. So how do we solve this Kurat's puzzle? I propose that we do it by considering the grammatical features 12 of which I have listed on the handout. Now, each of these features has a different distribution. Not all of them are confined to the Midland area by any means. 
Not all of them are used here in Missouri. But all of them, to a significant degree, occur either in the lower Mississippi Valley, in western Pennsylvania, in the Appalachian Mountains, or in the Upper South. And they can very legitimately be called Midland usages. If we collectively take these features, 12 of them, they provide a convincing inventory uh, a convincing set of evidence that the Ulster migrants, in fact, left a legacy to American English. Now, we said something a minute ago about why vocabulary uh, apparently disappeared. If you had a term like Irish competing with uh, a term like Chile, um, Irish would have been uh, used by a smaller group of people uh, and it probably uh, would not have been reinforced, certainly would not have been reinforced uh, in the schoolroom. Uh, and uh, vocabulary like that, uh, we can easily uh, imagine, uh, could be lost. Now, why is it that these grammatical features that were brought by Ulster immigrants were also not lost uh, along the way? Well, I think I have uh, some explanations for that. First, we must, uh, we must remember that culture, including language, is a many-layered phenomenon. We, and here I mean all of us, not just scholars of the English language, uh, very often tend to assume that with the acquisition of literacy and the coming of higher education, not to mention more urbane and modern mainstream lifestyles, that modern standard language replaces the traditional non-standard language that our family has used for generations. Uh, perhaps uh, we remember from our grandparents. This may be this uh, latter uh, so-called non-standard uh, language. Uh, uh, may be uh, appropriate for our grandparents but we can see uh, that uh, it's much less uh, appropriate uh, in the modern world uh, in which we live. Uh, this tendency of language to be replaced, of course, can most easily be seen uh, if we consider vocabulary. Uh, any of us can compare the language of our grandparents with uh, our own language or our own language in the language of our children uh, to notice how much of the terminology, uh, the vocabulary, even the definitions of terms uh, have changed. Just bring up uh, the word dinner at the next family reunion and see how many definitions uh, you have for dinner. Uh, I will guarantee you that different generations will have different definitions of that term. Every semester, I poll my undergraduate students to see uh, what they know and what they don't know. The term I grew up with for the breastbone of a chicken, a polybone, has been unknown by a single student at the University of South Carolina for the last five years that I've polled students. And it used to be the dominant term in South Carolina. So, language can change very quickly, particularly vocabulary. But we must also uh, realize that many of us can maintain both modern and traditional value systems. And this is true also for language. In other words, when we uh, acquire higher education, when we develop literacy, this is not necessarily uh, going to extinguish uh, a more vernacular kind of language that we have inherited. And there's no necessary reason why uh, literacy will completely change uh, the way people talk anyway. Let me cite four specific reasons for why I think these particular grammatical features have been preserved. One of them is that grammatical features in general, I think, are harder to root out. They often involve, since they have, uh, uh, they involve combinations of uh, of words, they involve rules and constraints. They are uh, acquired unconsciously. 
And whereas they may not be used in writing or in monitored situations, very often people will slip back into a more vernacular language, a vernacular grammar, when they're not uh, being careful about the way they speak. And some of these terms, I would argue, uh, would uh, tend to be used in more relaxed styles. Uh, I sometimes ask my undergraduate students, uh, when do they use non-standard language uh, the most? And uh, I get a surprisingly consistent answer uh, after they have two beers. Uh, but the point is the same, that it's when people relax the most that there is a tendency to use more vernacular, more colloquial grammar. I think grammatical features can also be maintained because sometimes they're stylistic variants. Uh, they're used by people, even those highly literate people, uh, to express more emphasis or maybe more emotion, uh, maybe for a specific rhetorical uh, purpose. Uh, or to uh, uh, try to uh, achieve uh, a certain goal uh, in talking uh, to someone. Uh, that is, they may f uh, fall out of general everyday use, uh, but that doesn't mean that in a given situation where they're quite useful, uh, they may not uh, arise. Uh, one good example of this is the combination might could. Uh, which in fact is uh, used by highly edu uh, educated people throughout the South and into the lower Midwest, I understand, but generally only when you're being deferential and polite, only when you're negotiating something like, I wonder if you might could help me. You don't want to offend or intrude on someone else. You don't want to just say, help me. And so the combination of those words uh, expresses the precise nuance, the pragmatics of the situation. That, I think, uh, tends to uh, ensure that those, those, those very subtle uses of terms to ensure their uh, preservation. Uh, thirdly, some of these terms are, in fact, extraordinarily useful. Uh, for instance, the pronouns y'all and nuance. Uh, even the best of us, or maybe uh, you know, even the most educated of us, when we want to be sure we're addressing uh, more than one person, we want to be sure to include everybody, we will adopt some strategy so that you would not interpret it as a singular. Uh, of course, uh, simple pronouns like y'all and yuns do this most efficiently. They're highly functional. And I think this will ensure their continued use, or at least the continued use of vernacular second person plural pronouns of some kind. A fourth reason that these uh, have been preserved, I think, is that some of them are disguised. In other words, they're very common words, but they're used in only a particular way that people don't tend to notice uh, because everyone has the word in their uh, linguistic system. I think the best example of this is the term whenever. And if you look at the very end of your handout, you'll see uh, whenever has a uh, definition here for meaning something that happens at the very moment that or uh, as soon as. So that we have examples like, whenever I heard about it, I signed up right away, which means only one time that this individual signed up. Or, what did they do with you whenever you killed that man? Well, you could kill him only once, after all. Now, whenever is a very, very common word. Everybody uses it. But not everybody uses it to mean at the present time or at a given moment. Uh, particularly, they don't use it to refer to something in the past that, hand, uh, that, that uh, happened only once. Uh, a number of years ago, um, a colleague of mine uh, who moved from Michigan to South Carolina, where this term is known, uh, in addition to much more widely through the Midland area, and Don Lance tells me is quite widely used here in central Missouri, 
A colleague of mine moved from Michigan to South Carolina, uh, and one day she uh, had uh, uh, an emergency in her kitchen, and she called a plumber, and the plumber told her that he would be over, quote, whenever he could, quote, unquote. And when he said that, she angrily told him not to come at all, thinking that he was going to, to take his time. Or actually, using whenever to mean as soon as, as this particular uh, plumber uh, was doing, uh, expresses that uh, he realized the urgency of the situation and that he was actually saying that he would come over at the very next available free moment. But he was misunderstood because my friend from Michigan doesn't use whenever to mean as soon as, and of course she overreacted. So I think that this kind of explanation is quite useful uh, in showing us how uh, terms can be preserved uh, almost hidden and disguised for a long period of time. My argument then is that the Scotch-Irish in Lua is deeply rooted in vernacular language. Uh, it is uh, characterized by certain highly functional usages, uh, sometimes uh, subtle variations on common words, and that all of these things have uh, ensured uh, or at least uh, assisted uh, its survival over the past two centuries. Uh, some of the hallmark features of Scotch-Irish grammar cited here can be found in uh, many of the from others in a piece together through consulting local linguists and historians uh, in Ireland uh, and Scotland. But so far as I can tell, their distribution in this country is largely Midland and in the British Isles, it's Ulster, and ultimately many of them do in fact go back to Scotland. So what I incline to uh, is an overlay view of cultural preservation. What I mean is that there are, uh, um, for, for all of us, there are borrowings uh, from mainstream culture uh, and language, and they're added to our cultural stock and our cultural knowledge, but they don't necessarily mean that our previous language or our previous cultural ideas are replaced. This thesis about the Scotch-Irish influence is not predictive. We can't begin with an element of 18th century Ulster speech and propose with any certainty where uh, or even uh, whether uh, it will appear in American English. Not only did Ulster derived settlers and their descendants go well nigh everywhere, fanning throughout uh, the, the country except for the northernmost tier of states, but linguistic features do in fact have a life of their own. And this accounts for the different distribution of these terms uh, on this side of the water, I would argue. Many of them disappear for reasons that we will never know. But this thesis of mine about the Ulster ancestry of Midland speech is explanatory. It states that any grammatical feature which is found in the Middle States, particularly in the lower Midwest or the upper South, as opposed to either the, North Mid the northern Midwest or the lower South, most likely has an Ulster source. And recently, there have been two dictionaries published in Ulster that will help us not uh, only to investigate, but to confirm and to test the, this thesis. Uh, this afternoon, we've considered a people who have most often by Americans been called the Scotch-Irish. We've looked at their history. We've looked at their language. Over the past 400 years, they've been given many faces. From historic figures of determined pioneers and trepid backcountry folk to narrow-minded poor whites. In the same manner, modern-day portrayals of their Ulster cousins, the people who are sometimes put on American television as the contentious bellicose clones of Reverend Ian Paisley, uh, come to mind. These people share ancestors 
with the Scotch-Irish who migrated to North America more than 200 years ago. If the faces of the Scotch-Irish, the people we've considered who migrated, are in fact quite varied, it stands to reason this is probably the case still today in the north of Ireland. And if we were to go to Ulster today, Ulster Protestants will not only have many faces, but they would have many voices. It is the traditional speech, though, in those parts of the province that were settled by Scots in the 17th century that has played such a crucial role in the development of American English. So many of the ancestors of Ulster Protestants today were our own ancestors, and so many of their voices have become part of the distinctive Midland speech that we hear every day. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. We have some. Questions? Uh, I wonder if you find where uh, you and you all are concerned. What, I'm pretty sure out in southwestern Missouri that uh, you all and other things like what all are used quite commonly by people of all levels of education. But humans would be a mark of absolutely inferior mm -hmm. uh, social standing, etc. It's frowned upon very severely. Yeah. Uh, it certainly is today. Uh, I can speak with any authority at all, only of uh, eastern Tennessee, where I'm from. And I think it's fair to say that Ewan's has been very rapidly replaced by y'all and you all in the last two generations. Uh, but it used to be very, very common. Ewan's actually represents a more general tendency, and that is to contract the word ones to a uh, noun or pronoun, or actually an adjective as well. So that uh, in uh, American speech, we have terms like youngin, or littlin, or biggin, and so on. And those, I think, uh, clearly have Ulster ancestry. But by the same token, uh, the pronoun all, and this is, I believe, on the list uh, on the handout, is very often combined with uh, interrogative pronouns to uh, express uh, inclusiveness. Uh, and this goes back to one of the uh, explanations that I had. Uh, there is just something more functional about saying, what all did he say, than uh, what did he say. Uh, you're indicating that you want the whole story. Uh, and so it's not uh, unusual at all to hear what all, who all, where all did you go, uh, and so on. I've even heard why all, why all did he do that? You know, but the tendency to add all in this part of the country, uh, the Midland region, is really quite common so far as I know. Hey. I'm older than anybody here, I think. I'm 94, but I, I uh, came from Scotland. And uh, I wasn't there when, uh, when the Vikings came there and they screwed the women there and... Uh, and uh, then uh, they, uh, we, we were weak. My clan was, was weak. And, uh, and they, they, uh, they robbed our women. And uh, we, we'd uh, run over and, and try to get the women back, but we, we couldn't, uh, couldn't win anything. So in, uh, like a lot of the people from Scotland, they ended up in uh, Ireland. Mm -hmm. And uh, so during the... Uh, uh, the tapeta, uh, potato famine mm -hmm. there in, uh, uh, in Ireland, uh, we came over to America and we ended up in Pennsylvania, that's where we landed, in Pennsylvania, and then we moved down the valley and, uh, and came over the mountains uh, into Tennessee and Kentucky and then on up into Illinois and finally ended up in northern Missouri, I did. And, uh, that uh, is part of my story, and uh, so <laughs> I just wanted you to know 
that uh, uh, literature and uh, words have changed much in my lifetime. I was mm -hmm. born in 1903, and I know that my parents came from Illinois and, and uh, Kentucky and, and so on. But I have seen many changes in, in my lifetime, mm -hmm. uh, which is 94 years in, mm -hmm. in uh, words and so forth. A good program. I almost went to sleep. <laughs> well, I I assume that if it weren't quite so good, you would surely have gone to sleep then, right? When? Yes. This may be somewhat off the subject, but the uh, word "scotch" is an adjective is never used now except in connection uh, with the whiskey. And it's always Scots and Scottish. And I noticed in 19th century books the word Scotch was used. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, um, a Scotch was used as the adjective. Do you have any um, explanation for that? Um, well, do you know where the term Scotch comes from, the adjective? It's just a form of Scottish. It's Scottish reduced to one syllable. Yeah. So Scottish becomes Scotch. Now, Scotch is not used in this country today, except in reference to the drink. I and mean, in the term Scotch-Irish, it's sort of a frozen form. I mean, that's a term that's been used for several generations, and it has a life of its own. However, if you do go to Northern Ireland today, Scotch is the traditional term for the language. Uh, it is sometimes, it is called by academicians Ulster Scots, but the people call it Scotch, or broad, or braid Scots, Scotch, uh, and they talk about the, you know, the, uh, the fiddling as being Scotch, uh, and so on. So it has rather wider currency there today, although it probably is a more rural than urban currency. Well, I have uh, I've had a number of people in uh, Northern Ireland frown on it. They say, you know, be sure not to say Scotch Irish. Uh, but I think that's just because they're you know they have a hang up about uh, about the drink. I mean, there's no there's no implication if you use the term Scotch Irish that it has anything to do with liquor. Uh, it seems to me, um, and that's, this is the term that scholars have used for a hundred years. It has. Uh, you know, it's widely accepted. I don't see any convincing reason not to use it. Well, except that it is frowned on there. Well, I would say that some middle class people, uh, you know, who are teetotalers, uh, frown on it for what I said in the presentation, what I consider to be prudish reasons, for lack of a better word. But among the people themselves, once you get out in the countryside, Scotch is rather widely used. The one in the back. Are you saying that Ulster's had a disproportionately large influence on American English? I'm sorry, that it had what? Uh, disproportionately. An unusually large influence on American English. And so, why do you think that would be? Well, um, I think it's clear that Ulster did have a very, uh, an unusually large influence. Um, this is uh, a subject that could be looked at uh, uh, in much greater detail, actually. I've done a, a fair amount of work, uh, for instance, analyzing the letters of black Civil War soldiers. And they evidence features that are unambiguously Scotch-Irish, you know, that they had picked up from uh, uh, southern whites in the antebellum uh, days, uh, I, or, or maybe their ancestors did somewhere uh, along the way. Uh, I think uh, many of the features that they brought over escape the uh, censor of the schoolroom uh, because they found these nooks and crannies of usefulness in the language or because they were so highly useful. Uh, terms like y'all and yuans and what all and so on. Uh, if we didn't have those, we would just have to, 
you know, use something that was a lot more complicated. Uh, and so for simplicity's sake, I think many of these terms have, have, have had a life of their own. Uh, you don't find them in writing. Uh, you very rarely hear them uh, at uh, uh, at least formal public occasions. Uh, but they're quite widespread in speech if you listen to people. In view of the time, uh, if there are more questions, uh, please feel free to ask uh, Professor Montgomery across the hall at the reception. Okay. Thank you very much. Great.